If China and the United States went to war over any reason, Taiwan, something to the South China Sea, and the war goes nuclear, would the United States win? Is it even possible to win a nuclear war? And what are the opportunities and the possibilities of there being a war at all, whether a conventional or nuclear between the United States and China? Is one inevitable? These are some of the really, really important questions that we need to ask and, and get some answers to, because while we're a lot of the world is focused on, for understandably, on the Russia-Ukraine war, which is ongoing, or the explosive Middle East, which just seems to always be on a, a hair's edge from uh, turning into itself a big regional conflict. This one, uh, possibilities here in the Indo-Pacific uh, have just enormous implications for global security and U.S. national security, et cetera. So uh, we thought it was important to take a, a look at that today, especially given some recent comments and some reports that have come out. And to discuss this, we have an exceptional view today. Uh, we have a panel here. We have uh, uh, first former Ambassador Chas Freeman, who uh, used to be an ambassador to Saudi Arabia, but was also the Charge Aid Affair in the DCM in the Beijing Embassy in 1981-84. Uh, as well as many other senior uh, posts that he's had. And we have Lyle uh, Goldstein, who is the uh, Asia Director for uh, director of Asia Engagement for Defense Priorities, uh, where, where I also work. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, grateful to have you back on with us today. Happy to be here. Yeah, likewise. Well, listen, uh, this is uh, this is kind of an important issue here, and, and it's it's kind of been on the back burner, at least uh, it's on the stove, but it's been on the back burner, I think, because of all these other issues going on here. But I, I know that uh, issues related to U.S. and China and, and Indo-Pacific security is really important to both of y'all. And, and Mr. Ambassador, I, I just wanted to start with you first. Uh, why do you think it's important for us to pay more attention to this than maybe we have been? Well, first of all, we had an official realization which we expressed in a solemn international statement uh, that a nuclear war can never be won and should never be fought. Uh, and yet the new Biden produced nuclear doctrine uh, is aimed at enabling the United States to wage and win a nuclear war, not just against Russia or China, but uh, also against uh, North Korea. Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and any other foe who develops nuclear weapons. Um, the, the, the problem of uh, a war with China uh, is that uh, at this point, it's very uncertain whether we could prevail in a conventional war. Any escalation to the nuclear level, which the Chinese are preparing to deter by building a vastly greater uh, retaliatory capability out in the Gobi Desert would result in a nuclear exchange, which could not just end life in the United States and China, but on the entire planet. So this is no joke. Uh, and yet uh, the nuclear allergy in the United States appears to have badly eroded. We have people talking about developing tactical nuclear weapons for use on the battlefield again, as sort of thing we were talking about in the 1950s. And uh, we, are, uh, we are modernizing our nuclear force with new fuses uh, that will double their capacity to conduct a preemptive uh, nuclear first strike uh, on uh, missiles in silos in both Russia and China. Uh, Lyle, I want, I want to bring you in because you, you actually just published a piece in the Washington Times uh, a week or so ago. Uh, where you're saying, hey, the U.S. is right to question whether we would come to Taiwan's defense, because there are certainly many in the United States that absolutely think we could, and we should get rid of strategic ambiguity in deference to strategic clarity of saying we would do that. We'll discuss that here a little bit more. But uh, on the issues there that uh, uh, Ambassador Freeman just mentioned here, what do you see, because of your experience in dealing with Chinese, when, what do they do when they hear these kinds of things? Like they see this announcement of this new fuses, of this document that seems to focus on trying to win a nuclear engagement. How does China react when they see this? Are they deterred or do they have a different reaction? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, uh, Danny. It's it's such an honor to appear with uh, here with you. Um, Ambassador Freeman and yourself, you know, two people who I admire uh, very intensely. Um, well, you know, I I, um, I was in China quite recently, uh, also last year, and uh, gave a lecture at Tsinghua University, which is one of China's leading 
universities and uh, in the room were gathered some of their leading experts on on uh, nuclear strategy, actually. And uh, we talked this over and uh, I was shocked to learn that um, when I said, you know, my, my sense is that that uh, the Chinese side now is seriously studying the issue of limited nuclear war and what that would involve. And they shook their heads in agreement and said, yes, we are studying that. And I, I was really shocked because I've never I, I, I never experienced anything like that in China before. You know, usually they just insist they have a minimal deterrent and no uh, no interest at all in these ideas. And they said, we, yeah, we're studying it very carefully because because we know you're studying it, you know, and and uh, so that's where things are at. And both sides are making these calculations. I mean, of course, China, uh, probably your listeners all know that China is rapidly building up its nuclear forces. I mean, they're still far from what we have. But, um, you know, that it's very clear to me that their general intent is is to sort of duplicate what uh, Putin has done with uh, with Russia. I mean, it was all, all, always the case since the 1970s that the Soviets had a huge nuclear arsenal. But the idea is to deter the United States uh, and to, you know, say to the U.S., basically, you don't want to go there. And uh, that's exactly the message, I think, that China is trying to deliver. And they are indeed uh, the last. The report that Ambassador Freeman just referenced, uh, that was a David a, a, a Sanger article in the New York Times, uh, part of that uh, disturbing article, which talked about, um, you know, the Biden administration's readjustment of U.S. nuclear plans to deal with, you know, simultaneous nuclear war with all these powers. But it also said there that that China is uh, uh, putting, you know, basically deploying weapons into these new silos at a more rapid uh, clip than than had been previously expected. So th this rival, this nuclear rivalry is taking off. Uh, all kinds of uh, crazy ideas are being batted around Washington, as Ambassador Freeman said. It's it's very disturbing. And we have to nip this in the bud. Uh, that's that's my view. And, and, yeah. just say, and just say we will not fight a nuclear war with China, certainly not over Taiwan. And Mr. Ambassador, I, I know you've got a lot of context to be able to to see any evolving or changing uh, Chinese uh, attitudes over time. Because I know you were involved in the 1972 opening of China. You were, I understand, you were a, a translator actually for the uh, the Nixon uh, team that was going on there, and talked to a lot of these people. Over the time, have you seen a shift in in Chinese views towards nuclear weapons? Uh, and how would you characterize it today as say? 10, 15 years ago? Well, there's been a, a, a steady evolution. Let's remember that the Chinese nuclear program uh, was developed in response to at least three, uh, uh, which we can count on our side, uh, six, the Chinese claim, direct threats from the United States to use nuclear weapons against China, starting in the Korean War, going through the various offshore island crises of the 1950s, uh, and continuing into the 1960s. Uh, the Chinese nuclear program was conceived as a deterrent. Um, the Chinese also had a doctrine, very clear, no first use of nuclear weapons. In other words, their, their nuclear weapons were purely a deterrent. We have always reserved the right to do what we did during at the end of World War II, namely to use nuclear weapons uh, against a non-nuclear state. The Chinese have never asserted that, uh, that policy. Uh, so um, what, uh, going along, um, uh, the, 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 there was an agreement uh, in, on detargeting. Both sides agreed, neither side would target the other. Uh, that's obviously gone by the boards because the main purpose of the reformulated Biden nuclear doctrine is uh, China. And we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons preemptively in a first strike which is not very reassuring. Uh, there has been no arms control uh, uh, during uh, all this period uh, with the Chinese. Arms control is a useful means of threat reduction, and threat management. Uh, it's, uh, it has not been practiced with China in part because of the fact that the Chinese policies were so different from ours. Uh, they already had a commitment and they deployed their forces in a manner consistent with it, not to use nuclear weapons first whereas we insert the right to use them when we want. Uh, so there was no basis for 
arms control discussions with the Chinese. But in the broader context, we've given up on arms control. We're not pursuing it with the Russians. We have abandoned it uh, as a means of controlling that relationship. And of course, apparently not content with having uh, driven Russia and China to develop huge nuclear arsenals, we've now pushed North Korea into reliance on a nuclear deterrent against our constant threats. Um, you know, it's interesting that you say that, that you know, we, we've abandoned any kind of arms control talks with the Russians and we haven't even engaged any with the, with the, with the Chinese side. And, and as we're going to see here in a minute, there's the Center for New American Security, CNAS, actually came out with a, a, um, a, some results of some war games they had, which we're going to talk about in some detail here in a minute. Uh, but it's, it's advocating the exact opposite. Instead of talking about threat reduction, let's talk about managing nuclear escalation, uh, which I find very, very alarming. We'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, but, but first of all, uh, Lyle, I want to get to something you raised in your article there in the Washington Times piece by looking at something that some people have been saying, because you have a lot of people saying that we need to be ready for more action with China, not, not that we need to see about de-escalating and whether Biden means what he has said when he has said we're going to fight for Taiwan against China. We'll also see that here in a second. But first of all, I want to look at uh, one of the guys who's one, been one of the bigger hawks against China, and that's Gordon Chang. Here he was, uh, I believe, earlier this summer saying something that he says a lot and that a lot of people agree with here that uh, lots of flashpoints uh, in the in the in the Indo-Pacific, not just the China, China, Taiwan issue. Watch this. Do you think the Chinese see the inevitability of a Trump presidency and that they are doing things like positioning troops in Belarus, moving their carriers in the Taiwan Straits in the Philippines? Do you think they're doing that as a, a way to stage themselves for negotiating points against a, perhaps a more stronger president? Well, yeah, and they certainly see a closing window of opportunity, which closes on January 20, 2025. And so right now at this moment, we don't have to speculate because China is engaging in extremely belligerent activities at Second Thomas Shoal and other features in the South China Sea. And those are flashpoints which are could lead, very well lead to war. So according to Gordon Chang and, and all those who follow his view, uh, Lyle, uh, China is the one who is uh, pushing for war with all of these actions. Uh, how do you see that part? Well, look, uh, I mean, the first thing to do, I think, uh, and I, you know, I've met uh, Gordon Chang and, and uh, you know, he has his view. We've, we've uh, had a bit of debate. I would love to debate him in the future because I think he's dead wrong, you know, pretty much across the board. Uh, since he, I think it, it was he who predicted the collapse of China not long ago. Um, uh, he, um, you know, in general, I mean, I think we have to start with some uh, simple um, uh, basics at the outset here of a discussion about China. And it was, I think we should start looking at a map, you know, and when you look at that map, you see that all these uh, disputes, uh, whether it's in the South China Sea or uh, more particularly um, with respect to Taiwan, um, this is right up against uh, uh, the China coast. Uh, you know, in the case of Taiwan, it, they, they consider that a province of China. Um, and I think, you know, Americans would be wise to ask these basic questions, say, if this was going off, uh, go, going on right, uh, right off the U.S. coast or indeed uh, was impacting a territory we consider to be ours that, you know, uh, so th this would uh, this behavior would be, uh, you know, just think of U.S. Uh, actions in the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. Um, you know, so it's not uh, strange at all to see a great power react uh, or, or to bristle and flex its muscles in its own neighborhood. And, and in that way, there is some echo with the uh, with the Ukraine war currently underway. To me, th this is normal behavior of great powers and consistent with uh, China's actions generally. But let's keep in mind, China has not resorted to a major use of force since 1979. So I think if you look across the board and put you know all the great powers up against each other and, and look at their uh, list of armed conflict, that there's no question that China generally is acting with a lot of restraint. Uh, and I think part of it is they just prefer to focus on economic development and, and uh, make a lot of money and, and spread their influence that way. And that, that is, you know, they're quite content with that approach. But uh, there are some exceptions here. And Taiwan is a huge 
you know, flashing exception, but the South China Sea is also an area where they're quite tender after all, a lot of their sea, the crucial sea lanes uh, pass through that area. So I don't think it's surprising at all. And I would not term it as aggression either. Can I, uh, yeah, go ahead, you know, sure. Let me just add something. I think Gordon Chang has made a career of uh, belligerence against China. Uh, for 30 years, he's been predicting its imminent collapse. It hasn't happened. I think his uh, description of what is happening in the South China, China Sea uh, has to be taken with a very large grain of salt. His principal uh, qualification as an expert on China is that he's ethnically Chinese. Well, that's not much of a qualification at all. Um, so let me just make a few points. Um, we are in China's face, as Lyle said. We are all along its coast. We run three to four intrusive patrols along that coast every day. Uh, we contest uh, Chinese uh, presence in the South China Sea. Um, we have adopted the claims of others as our own. We have no claims of our own in the region. And uh, to just uh, mention, uh, clarify Lyle's point about uh, about two thirds of the uh, ship traffic through the South China Sea is en route to or from China or carried on Chinese bottoms. There is no one who has a bigger stake in freedom of navigation in the South China Sea than China. And who might disrupt that? Well, the US Navy plans to do so in the event of a Taiwan contingency. So the Chinese, I think, we're caught in a feedback loop. Uh, this is a classic uh, security dilemma. They're doing things they consider defensive. We consider them aggressive or offensive and vice versa. Uh, and uh, we're not talking to the Chinese. So um, all this is going on um, on, on autopilot with no adult supervision, at least on our side. Well, you know, it's interesting you talk about the, you know, the, the reaction to folks have one is offensive, one is defensive, one is freedom of navigation, one is the other. Uh, we uh, had uh, earlier this summer, uh, or yeah, yeah, I think it's just, just not too long ago, uh, there was, uh, I think it was a joint Russia Chinese patrol that was near some of the Aleutian Islands, uh, you know, outside of, uh, of uh, uh, United States and a lot of anxiety about that. And on Fox news, they were like some outraged that how dare China get near any Alaska islands. And so they brought on representative Gallagher uh, to give his view on that. And well, watch how that went. It seems obvious to me that Xi Jinping is preparing his country for war. He would prefer to take Taiwan without having to fire a shot or resort to war. Like but Hong he's Kong. repeatedly told us he intends to take Taiwan by force if necessary. And he's probing, probing with bayonets. If he finds steel, he'll stop. But if, if he finds mush, he's going to continue to push. That's how Marxist-Leninist regimes operate. It, Mr. Ambassador, is that how Marxist Leninists operate? That uh, they're probing with a bayonet, just looking for any opportunity to go to war? Uh, I think it's utter nonsense, frankly. It's got nothing to do with Marxism, Leninism. Leninism is alive in, in China, but Marxism is on life support if it hasn't already expired. Uh, but the main point is this is an issue for Chinese nationalism. Why? Because Taiwan symbolizes the failure of the revolution, both revolutions, 1911, the Kuomintang revolution, and the communist revolution in 1949 to achieve the unification of China, to remove foreign spheres of influence, like that in Taiwan of the United States from Chinese territory, uh, to complete uh, the subordination of provincial level officials to the central government. Um, and this is what it's about. It's not about ideology. Basically, the Chinese long ago offered to let Taiwan preserve its both its socioeconomic system completely and its political system. I mean, Taiwan is a robust democracy. It is admirable in many ways. Uh, is that a reason for the United States to defend it? Um, well, that's a question. Are we going to risk nuclear war with China in order to preserve an ideological bastion? Uh, is Cha Taiwan vital to our national interest, so much so that we contest the territorial limits of a nuclear superpower. Uh, these are quite, we never did that, by the way, with the Russians. We did not accept uh, their inclusion of the Baltic states, but we never attempted to defend them against the Soviet Union or detach them from the Soviet Union. We're talking about 
dismembering an entity called China that we have recognized includes Taiwan, even though it's not under the People's Republic of China's jurisdiction in our view. Uh, so uh, this is very complicated. And I want to make a final point. I can see Lyle is getting um, uh, into the blocks and about to launch forward in a sprint. But, um, <laughs> but um, I want to make a fundamental point here, and that is we, for, for, for 30 years, we recognized that the government of China was in Taipei, not in Beijing. And it was not a government in exile because it was on Chinese soil. Now we've decided we're not so sure about that. When we normalized relations with Beijing, back in, it began the process in 1972, um, we concluded it in the end of 1978, and we abandoned our defense commitment to Taiwan. And we replaced it with an arms sales policy that would allow Taiwan to defend itself while it reached an accommodation with the Chinese across the strait peaceful resolution of this issue through negotiations. Somehow, that abandonment of a defense commitment, which was confirmed by the Taiwan Relations Act, where we undertook to provide weapons and maintain a capacity to intervene if necessary, but made no commitment to defend Taiwan, somehow that has all gone by the board. Uh, the president, without any constitutional authority whatsoever, has reasserted a treaty-like commitment to defend Taiwan on four occasions. That is a violation not only of the Constitution, but of the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, and by the way, I'll just finish up, you know, I'm a veteran of uh, war in the Middle East. We did not need a treaty with Kuwait to come to its rescue when Iraq uh, tried to annex it. We did not need a treaty with uh, anyone uh, to go into Iraq. It was a foolish thing to do uh, in 2003, but we did it. We have the ability to act in pursuit of our own interests when that is required. What exactly are our interests in Taiwan? That is a question that uh, needs to be addressed. It does. And, and Lyle, I, I, if you have something to say, I want to jump into that. But I, I would, did want you to at least include one specific thing, because you mentioned you, you have recently been in China and talked to some of these folks here. How do they view these what we call freedom of navigation operations, where we continue to sail near Chinese territory and go through the straits, et cetera? Hmm. Uh, yeah, let, let me come to freedom of navigation. And in, a, in a minute, I, I worked for the Navy for 20 years. So I I got my ear full of, of, of freedom of navigation. <laughs> nice. Um, but I did just want to comment. I mean, first of all, everything has just said, I would underline it two or three times. Um, he is the nation's expert on uh, these matters, and we better listen really carefully to, to everything he has to say, as I have uh, through my career. Um, uh, you know, uh, one more thing I'd just add on Taiwan, and there's a lot to say on Taiwan, of course. Um, but I don't think most Americans realize that the constitutional title of uh, this island is, uh, this entity, is uh, the Republic of China, uh, not the Republic of Taiwan. And that's critically important to uh, understand. And once Americans grapple with the fact that they're contemplating going to war for the Republic of China, uh, against the People's Republic of China, um, I think that it will become, uh, uh, in flashing light, uh, that kind of moment of clarity that we are, are uh, hell-bent, it seems, on uh, re-entering a civil war, which uh, Nixon and Kissinger tried to extract us out of. Um, I think we've had plenty of experience with Asian civil wars. You know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, the list is very long at this point. So let's, you know... I think once Americans kind of clue into that uh, fully, that they will realize uh, what a huge mistake it would be to try to do this. Um, I, I, one point on the Aleutians, I would just say, too, is, I mean, yes, I, I think if you look at a map again and you see the Aleutians, how far they go into the North Pacific, that it is kind of insane, uh, an insane double standard that we uh, get pretty ticked off when uh, China sorties 
uh, its ships and aircraft uh, and probably in the future surveillance yeah. robots and so forth into these areas. And by the way, if we continue along this path of, of this new Cold War, there will be much, much more of that. And they will be off the California coast and uh, be off the East Coast. Um, those, you know, I assure you that those, you know, the, the, those operations are in the planning stages in China. They can't do it yet, but they will do that. They will uh, come to our uh, front door. Uh, and we will not like it at all. Uh, on freedom of navigation, I mean, that that's, uh, you know, quite, quite a related point here that, um, you know, for, for a long time that we have uh, insisted that that is what we're doing. But as Ambassador Freeman laid out, I mean, uh, there's really no evidence of China um, uh, getting in the way of freedom of navigation. All of the commerce that crosses the South China Sea really is um, um, the vast majority is going to and from, you know, uh, Chinese ports to other destinations. So they don't have any interest in that. What we do see is them interfering on a very specific set of issues related to uh, uh, basically related to fisheries. That's a big deal. Uh, and to, um, you know, uh, prospecting, you know, for oil and gas and that kind of related activity. I don't think Americans want to go to war for for those issues, um, this this issue with the Philippines, it it is quite complex. But honestly, again, let's let's get back to basics. Do Americans seriously want to contemplate uh, war with another nuclear superpower over rocks and reefs? Again, yeah. common sense answer is no. Let's right, let's right. Uh, let the diplomats do their thing and figure this one out at some kind of compromise. And I do think that uh, there are <coughs> compromises to be had. After all, China says that its approach in the South China Sea it wants to do joint development, and I think uh, somehow it manages to get along with Malaysia, with Vietnam, Indonesia, these other countries. So I think this is manageable if yeah, uh, yeah. Manila is smart on these issues. Well, wow. with, with diplomacy for sure. One, one thing I want to discuss a little bit more because it's been mentioned a couple of times already, and that is the the one China policy that the United States has officially held for quite a number of years. And then the question of that Ambassador Freeman also touched on a second ago, would the U.S. defend Taiwan? So first of all, I want to look at the words that the U.S. is saying. This is very recently from Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, uh, playing out a pretty common sense view. Here's what he said. China believes that the continued U.S. arms sales to Taiwan and other actions have increased tensions in the Taiwan Strait. So how do you respond to this and what is the U.S. willing to do to de-escalate? Thank you. Our one China policy has not changed um, and our approach to this issue is guided by the one China policy, the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques and the six assurances. That remains true today. And that has remained true on a bipartisan basis through multiple administrations. And that policy has actually helped contribute to maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait for decades. And we intend to keep it that way. Now, Mr. Ambassador, you you were actually part of the, the U.S. that actually helped negotiate a lot of those things that he mentioned in there. So those words, as I understand, you would probably say, yeah, those are the right words. But do our actions line up with them? No, they don't. Um, they used to, perhaps, uh, to some extent. Um, the one China uh, principle, if you will, was not invented by us. It was invented by Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, he insisted there could only be one China, that he should control it. We recognized him as the legal government of China. And uh, so in 1971-72, when we pursued an opening with China to balance the threat of the Soviet Union, uh, we were able to say that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there's only one China and that Taiwan is part of China. And we said, we don't challenge that position. Well, now we apparently do in practice, although we play verbal games and claim that nothing has changed. Um, it is, we did do an agreement with the Chinese in 1982, an arms control agreement to limit our supply of weapons to Taiwan uh, to be commensurate with the threat of the use of force. It was not until we violated that commitment that China began the military buildup it has been engaged in uh, since basically uh, 1999, uh, which has culminated in its uh, development of military capabilities that in many respects, as Lyle can attest, now outmatch our own. Uh, and I would say, finally, with regard to the Philippines and others, uh, first of all, um, 
the, um, the, there is no problem. The Chinese and the Vietnamese appear to get along fine despite their historic enmity. Chinese get along well with Malaysia, uh, which has endorsed uh, reunification for Taiwan with the mainland. Uh, they get along well with Brunei, which is another potential claimant. They have a problem with the Philippines. Why is that? And it seems to be related to the fact that the United States is using the, uh, the dispute between the Philippines and China to establish bases, re-establish bases in the Philippines from which to strike China in the event of a war over Taiwan. And we appear to be encouraging the Filipinos to take a tough line um, militarily on the South China Sea territorial disputes rather than to pursue a negotiated solution. And here, let me say, you know, fisheries is a very, which, which I think Lyle mentioned, is a very, very important issue to all of the littoral states, Vietnam, China, Philippines, yeah. Malaysia, and so on. Um, there is a, a basis, if anyone cared to try it, if we were not so bellicose in our approach to this, uh, for composing something like the um, uh, Arctic uh, Council, uh, a council of the littoral states in the region to jointly manage fisheries. Um, it is arguable the only reason China has by default uh, taken on that role is because there is no such uh, a, a dialogue in the region. Uh, we keep inserting ourselves. We have nothing to add on that. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I'd say step back and let the people in the region sort out their own problems, uh, which indeed uh, they are quite capable of doing. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. We, we can't do that. I don't know if you saw, but the president said we're the indispensable nation and yes. we shape events. We don't let them happen. We have to lead the world and the world is. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I, well, how, I well are, it. how well are we shaping events? Are we shaping them <laughs> toward peace and prosperity for the United States or toward increased danger of nuclear war, not just with China, but with Russia and with North Korea. You know, I mean, if we're going to shape events, let's do it right, not wrong. Right. Couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, uh, it kind of going down that rabbit hole a little bit of, of, of areas of concern. Um, Lyle, one of the things, and I'm going to get to this in a second, that you, you were talking about in a recent Defense Priorities publication, uh, is that, you know, asking some of these questions should we uh, be involved in a war for Taiwan? Can we be involved? And I'm going to get to some of the things that were in that in a second. But first of all, I want to get to something that I also Ambassador Freeman referenced earlier, and that is uh, uh, President Biden has on numerous occasions actually said we would defend Taiwan. I want to first of all play uh, this from actually in 2022 where some of this was being addressed so you can see exactly what we're talking about. Last night on CBS's 60 Minutes, Biden took his pledge to defend the island one step further. Take a listen. To be clear, sir, U.S. forces, U.S. men and women would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. Yes. And when asked over and over whether the United States military would defend Taiwan in the event of an invasion by China, President Biden has said now several times categorically, yes, they would. Now, the last time he was asked about this, when he was on that overseas trip, he was asked specifically, would the U.S. military do more than they have done in Ukraine? And he said yes. Why that's so important, Morgan, is that that proves that when talking about the act of di defending Taiwan, He's, President Biden is not just talking about providing them with, with equipment or weapons or intelligence sharing or any kind of support, that he's talking about going a step further than that. The implication that most people take from that is that would involve actual U.S. military involvement, U.S. military action. Now, we, we have the, the one China policy, and you, you saw Jake Sullivan talking about it a second ago, but then you see the president has said this kind of thing. And as far as I've seen, I've never seen the president himself refute these kinds of things. So how does this play into uh, the potential for clashes in, in the South China Sea or with the United States and China, whether it's Taiwan or, or something else? Uh, what is the prospect that, that we could actually get involved with this conflict? Well, it's very provocative. Uh, it's way out in front of the Taiwan Relations Act. It's unconstitutional. The president does not have the authority to make defense commitments of that nature under the Constitution. That is a power reserved to Congress. In fact, that Congress chooses to default on its responsibilities under the Constitution is another very disturbing matter, but does not give the president the authority to commit the United States in that manner. 
And because it is provocative, it is the primary driver of the Chinese military buildup against Taiwan. And uh, the problem now is and that uh, there is no apparent path to a peaceful resolution of this issue. There was, uh, but now there is not. And uh, the Taiwanese side has abandoned its adherence to the one China principle and policy. And we have a president in Ta Taipei now who asserts that Taiwan's already independent. And uh, here I want to refer again uh, to something that you mentioned, Danny, and that is uh, that the world recognizes the island of Taiwan as the seat of the Republic of China. Uh, that uh, entity now has 12 countries that recognize it and maintain normal, full diplomatic relations with it. All of them recognize it as China, the government of China. As Lyle said, none of them recognize it recognize it as Taiwan or the Republic of, there's no Republic of Taiwan. Uh, there was once in about 1895, but uh, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. And, uh, and I want to go down that a little bit further, Lyle. Uh, this is something I'm showing here on my screen uh, that, that uh, you, you said here, or what defense priorities published here was, uh, would the U.S. really fight for Taiwan? Okay, we saw that's what President Biden has said in the past. Uh, but uh, you ask a couple of questions on here, or the, the authors of this piece did. Uh, I just want to go over a couple of them. Uh, it said, how could U.S. forces prevail when China's large armed forces are so proximate and prepare for this fight while our forces are on the end of a logistics train that stretches 10,000 miles across the Pacific? I think that's a really important point to point out. And, and uh, how, how do you answer that question? Uh, yeah, and that's why I think that uh, you know the president, uh, either either willfully or not, is is engaged in an elaborate kind of bluff, um, as are many in Washington. Because anybody who really takes a look at the military details here sees uh, quite immediately. After all, it's just, you know, just pull out a map and you see uh, the tremendous you know kind of asymmetry here uh, that geography uh, grants a huge advantage. Uh, to the Chinese armed forces in this scenario. I mean, in a way, it's a kind of dream scenario for them. And that's what's so scary about this. I mean, we could blunder into a kind of Tsushima Strait, if, if people know their history, uh, type disaster where our fleet losses are, um, you know, truly devastating of the type that, that uh, you know, uh, is the end of a superpower. So, you know, we just don't want to go there. Uh, and, and not only are they are the Chinese proximate, but they're prepared and focused, meaning they have focused singularly on this scenario for at least three decades, but really for more, uh, and prepared uh, in each and every way for, for each contingency. Now, I want to say that China does not want to fight a war with the U.S. Uh, that's absolutely clear. And they, I think, will do their utmost to persuade uh, those uh, few smart people in D.C. to realize that this is not worth doing. Uh, and that's uh, one reason they're building up their nuclear forces so robustly, because Americans might be wise enough to stand aside. Uh, I think I suspect they, they will be wise enough. Um, however, they're not counting on that. And they are indeed prepared to go there. And I'm more and more convinced that, um, you know, they have done uh, the homework. Uh, you know, they're dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And I do believe, uh, although you know, surely if it if it came to war, we would inflict uh, huge losses on the Chinese. I'm, I'm quite convinced they would prevail, actually. And, and a lot of this has to do with logistics, which I know, Danny, you, you, you know a lot about. But, uh, you know, keeping those uh, ships, for example, supplied with gas and, and uh, munitions, uh, and these are not small munitions. We're not moving 155 rounds around. We're moving torpedoes, which are, are yeah. uh, very dear, very costly, and very hard to move around, and very hard to put in a warship, including a submarine. So uh, these are tremendously vulnerable uh, logistics uh, nodes. Uh, the Chinese are well aware of that, and uh, this is a fight. Uh, we should not... Uh, enter into this fight. It, we are so severely disadvantaged that uh, if it comes to a war with China, and I dearly hope it does not, but this is the wrong place for such a, a war. And, and Mr. Ambassador, one of the other things you've seen from over the last year or so, especially from from a whole list of, of U.S. admirals 
uh, in congressional testimonies, they continue to talk about this big risk of China and to try to alleviate some of these things. They want multiple billion dollars of additional uh, defense spending in order to create more and more bases and other kinds of things around the, the, the Taiwan Strait area. Is this a good path for the United States? Is this going to make us more safe? And will it deter China? Uh, no to all of those questions. Um, it is um, it's not a good course. Uh, it's natural for uh, bureaucratic entities like military services to want more money um, and to and uh, threat exaggeration is the basic way to achieve that. Uh, but and you know they have a responsibility to do what the national command authority, the president directs them to do. The president, whether he has constitutional authority or not, has told them to prepare to enter a war with China over Taiwan, so they have to plan for that. That's not their fault. Um, and uh, I think, um, however, I want to make a few points. First of all, um, one thing the Ukraine war has shown us, by the way, it's a proxy war with Russia. Uh, we don't have our own troops directly involved in the fighting. Uh, they're, they're behind the Ukrainians, but they're not on the front line. Um, this would not be a proxy war. This is a direct war. It's far easier to finesse the nuclear matter if it's a proxy war than it is if you're directly attacking the Chinese homeland, which we would attend, which we, which we would do. Chinese military doctrine, as Lyle knows, is if you strike me, I will strike you. So we attack their homeland, they will attack ours by whatever means they consider appropriate. It could be just a cyber attack. But we're risking nuclear war with a nuclear power over over this issue. Um, and I think the other point is that another thing the Ukraine war has shown us is that we don't have the surge capacity we did in World War II. Uh, we are not the arsenal of democracy in the 21st century. Whether we have a democracy or not is increasingly debatable. Right. But uh, leave that aside. Uh, we are spending, uh, if you put well, you know, the defense budget is only about 60% of what we spend on military matters. Uh, and so we're spending well over a trillion dollars on the military, maybe a trillion and a half. Um, the Chinese are spending far less. The burden on their economy is far less, and they do have surge capacity. They have the ability to win a war of attrition, which is what this could easily turn it's into. So crucial to understand, yeah. Wow. Uh, could, could I just interject one yeah. you know, um, data point, which I think people should be aware of? Um, uh, CSIS, yeah. the, the, one of the leading think tanks in D.C., and, yeah. and not known for their, um, you know, the, they generally have supported this uh, policy of preparing for war with China. But they uh, came out with a study uh, a couple of months ago. They said that um, actually China has something like 230 times the shipbuilding capacity of the United States, not 23 times, which would be already a huge disadvantage, 230 times. And that uh, directly checks out with my experience, you know, spending a lot of time, I was just in Shanghai, but in, you know, I have walked uh, Chinese shipyards and uh, it is truly astounding um, what they're doing. But but here, you know, Ambassador Freeman is completely right that if it, if it comes to a war that lasts more than a month, uh, which it may very well uh, shake out that way, uh, it could go on for years. Uh, and uh, China is prepared to lose its navy and build another two or three navies. We cannot do that. If we yeah, and, and listen, I just want to highlight that point that is uh, how crucial it is to understand that. I mean, you're, you're seeing that the, the Russia-Ukraine war has basically devolved into a, a nutrition model warfare where it almost doesn't even matter hardly what your tactics are. It matters who's got the biggest industrial capacity, who's got the ability to sustain industrial capacity and especially arms and the side that doesn't. And right now, the Russia is slowly grinding down. Yeah. But I think well, that, one more data you point. point out, it's much bigger on the China-U.S. Uh, imbalance. Yes. And in fact, people don't realize if China put its industrial engine really to work for Russia, then the war would be over very quickly. And China has exercised restraint and not done that, which is very important for us to realize that. But uh, one more data point on shipbuilding, I would say it, it, it's often said, I think, uh, and quite right, that China has more shipbuilding capacity in Shanghai, just in Shanghai, than in than in the entirety of the United States. <laughs> can I, can I um, 
let me put this in a in a broader perspective because what causes you to lose on the battlefield or at the negotiating table is hubris overestimation of your own capabilities and capacities we say well we have a bigger economy than china well we do if you're counting insurance brokers tax lawyers uh <laughs> you know, uh, and so forth and so on. Chinese manufacturing sector is three times our size. It is now 36% of global manufacturing. We have fallen to about 12%. If you get into a war, uh, I'm sorry, insurance brokers are not terribly uh, relevant. And um, so uh, I think, you know, we have a health sector that eats up about 18, 19% of GDP and and still doesn't cover all americans and uh and you know and 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 is widely regarded by virtually everybody as a giant ripoff uh, so um this is uh you know okay so uh we have a bigger gdp so measured in dollars actually measured in purchasing power they're one third larger than us oh wow so we need to knock it off we need to recognize that you know we are a formidable country with huge advantages if we have the policies that that leverage those um, those characteristics, but we're not doing it. Yeah, and, and in fact, I, I want to actually transition into another thing here in the last uh, segment we have. Uh, and th all the things that we just got through talking about are on the, the operational and the tactical level, but there's also the potential for strategic escalation. And I know, Lyle, you talked about this in your uh, somewhat in your Washington uh, Times piece there, uh, but I want to go to a, a section here uh, on the, the Center for National uh, uh, New American Security, the CNAS. They they have uh, they just did a, a projected uh, escalation management, what they call in a pro in a protracted war. So they were they did some analysis on what would happen if the U.S. got into war with China over whatever reason, China, Taiwan, something, anything else. Uh, and the war that went beyond 45 days. So some of the CSIS and some other things have been looking at uh, really the first 30 days. This one said we're going to start with the 45th day and they're going to say it goes into uh, the, the nuclear uh, realm. And in fact, one of the, the findings it says is the, uh, the findings reflect the fundamental differences of deterrence in the emerging Indo-Pacific area where distinct geography targets and capabilities make limited nuclear escalation potentially more tolerable than in the Cold War era. And Mr. Ambassador, you you said a minute ago that the, the United States needs to start worrying about how to have diplomacy to get and, and nuclear limitation agreements. Again, get that back on the front burner. This CNAS thing is basically arguing the opposite direction. We need to start spending more time figuring out how we can manage the escalation and possibly win a nuclear war. What do you think about that? I think uh, threat management, threat reduction is a lot better than threat activation, which is what they're talking about. And I think they're nuts. Uh, I think we're talking about striking a war in the Chinese homeland. Uh, and then, and not in and the idea that somehow this could be a limited war, like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, or for that matter, up to now, the Ukraine War, is just crazy. If you hit the homeland of your nuclear armed enemy, you can be damn sure you're going to be hit back. So there is no distinction between tactical and strategic nuclear weapons in this theater. And to imagine there is, is insane. And, and uh, Lyle, I want to ask you on this next part, uh, Gary, if you could bring up that, that second uh, quote from the article there. Uh, it says, the CNS war game highlighted major divergencies of opinion on nuclear retaliation that will likely challenge U.S. decision makers and that it may result in capitulation compromises or ineffective counter coercion approaches. And one of the things that they're arguing is that we need to fix that and we need to get understand uh, how to manage going from the conventional to the nuclear uh, what what do you think about that? Because I know you mentioned some of that in your Washington Times piece. Well, yeah, I mean, I I actually uh, did my PhD in, in nuclear strategy, and so I've been following this debate closely. And and honestly, this was a pretty sleepy area of uh, U.S. China relations until I think just a couple of years ago. I mean, well, once China started building up a lot, but um, there are some really really disturbing ideas now bumping around Washington. There were two reports in the by the Atlantic Council, which basically seemed to argue the same 
sense of this CNAS report, although I have to study the CNAS report. But uh, basically, they're saying, you know, there are some pretty juicy targets out there for U.S. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons, you know, possibly uh, the so-called uh, Slickham N, the submarine launched uh, cruise missile with a nuclear warhead, you know, and by the way, our forces have been equipped recently with low yield warheads. So this suggests that we are uh, uh, contemplating this. And I, I, I have to suspect that this new update reported in that Sanger article last uh, week may have been some codification of these uh, new set of options. Uh, this is extremely disturbing. And I think um, uh, I think I, I generally agree with Ambassador Freeman's take. Um, look, if 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 we go there, if we really consider these options, then it's very likely uh, that we will lose Guam, uh, that that uh, Sasebo Harbor might get struck by a nuclear weapon, that June, you know Alaska, you know, is would be on the target list, Hawaii uh, as well. I mean. And it goes up from there. And let's remember uh, that book, uh, 2034, um, by uh, Admiral Stavridis that came out a few years ago, ended with the exchange of cities. Um, so it, it may not be the end of the planet. Uh, I guess we can hope the planet would survive and our country might even survive. But we would, you know, we might lose, uh, as in that book, uh, I think San Diego uh, was lost. Uh, imagine that, folks. So here's where we go from losing tens of thousands of sailors in a localized uh, straight crisis. And now we are losing millions of Americans and have whole uh, parts of our country uh, completely devastated. Um, and, you know, yes, I, I believe Ambassador Freeman is entirely correct that China would, um, you know, escalate pretty quickly to um, these kind of uh, probably counter value strikes against uh, targets like Honolulu. Yeah, so so that, Gary, bring up that third one there because this this is one of the more troubling, maybe the most troubling of, of all this that, that I said because they're talking about their findings that the United States lacks a doctrine and capabilities, so we need to force that or focus on that. So their recommendations are to fully integrate nuclear activities into the U.S. planning exercise, not just as a last day or standalone exercise. Reviving the skill for a great power competition and potential U.S. PRC conflict generates a powerful signal that the U.S. forces are alert to the threat of nuclear escalation and lessens the operational advantages that an adversary may seek to gain through limited nuclear use. So he is outright suggesting that, hey, we need to figure out how elsewhere they say to manage the uh, what was it? The, the crossfade, I think, is the term they use in there. So it should be part of our planning uh, to plan for and do exercises for going from conventional to nuclear and thinking that we can manage that somehow. Yeah, so can I can I make one more point here? Sure. You know, I, I think what what these Washington strategists don't seem to get or don't want to admit is that that new nu that step of nuclear escalation is just a proxy for interests. That is, how much are you willing to risk? How much are you willing to pay? Are you willing to lose cities over this? Uh, if it, if it, or you know, huge, uh, you know, naval armadas and so forth. And I don't doubt that China has the advantage when it comes to uh, national interest in this, and that's what they're what they're relying upon. And it's quite a strong. That's the same thing that Putin is relying. He cares about Ukraine much more than Americans do, and there's just no uh, defying that principle. So if we're talking about core interests, the side that has the uh, most uh, more obvious interests will prevail in a nuclear showdown. I have no doubt about that. That is called the that is called the balance of fervor, and it favors the Chinese. Absolutely. I, I want to make a number of points. If a Russian sub or a Chinese sub fired a tactical nuclear weapon at the city of Houston, would we regard that as a tactical nuclear weapon, or would we see it as it comparable to an ICBM fired at Houston from across the ocean? I think the answer is obvious. Would we not retaliate? We would. We're talking about a war in China, in China, uh, and against Chinese forces on their home territory. And you think that that somehow won't lead to their striking back? Uh, whether they... Finally, I just note that because the war is in China, the country with the biggest interest in avoiding escalation to the nuclear level is China. And um, we are the ones who propose first use, and these doctrines that CNAS is trying to develop suggest that it be integrated into our regular planning 
uh, we are the ones who propose to initiate a nuclear exchange. Do we know where that will end up in terms of how many dead Americans there will be? We should think about this. Yeah, um, that, that point really needs to be emphasized is that I think China's approach here is that they do not want this war to go nuclear. They don't want war, period, with the United States, but they, and, and therefore they are um, really doubling down on their no first use. And you can see that in all their rhetoric. In fact, they've made another outreach to Washington, uh, quite unusual, where they said, let's talk about no first use much more. And, and even the New York Times, I think, uh, which is fairly hawkish these days, but even them came around to saying, actually, we should talk this talk about this with China, that a no first use might make sense and try to put these, uh, let's say, put all these ideas from CNAS and the Atlantic Council, put them back in Pandora's box because that's where they belong. And Mr. Ambassador, you, you know, I mean, they have a no first use, uh, at least desire, of course, but when they see things like this, advocating that the U.S. actually put into normal planning the thought that we'll transition and have this crossfade into nuclear weapons as a, as a normal means of fighting, as a deterrence. How much of a deterrence does that res, uh, produce in China, or how much of an incentive does it produce for them to go the opposite direction? I think the incentives are the other way. Fortunately, so far, the Chinese seem to have continued to insist on no first use. As Lyle mentioned, they're trying to negotiate that with us and others. Uh, they condemned, by the way, Putin's threats of nuclear use uh, in Ukraine in, in, or the implied threat of a revised Russian nuclear doctrine. Uh, they condemned that. They said there should not be any first use under any circumstances. Um, and, you know, there's a long history here. Um, their forces were configured for no first use. They are now beginning to uh, achieve a launch on warning capability, which is the instant response to a perceived nuclear attack. And we're, you know, this means that if the United States gets into a war with that, with the Chinese, and we attack a Chinese base where nuclear weapons are stored, they will may see that as the equivalent of a nuclear attack. They cannot distinguish a missile with a nuclear warhead from one that doesn't have one. And so we're, we're entering an, er, uh, an area that is extremely dangerous. And finally, I will just note that there, and with regard to escalation control, there is no mechanism for escalation control that has been agreed between the United States and China. There is no effective military to military dialogue. We're talking past each other. We trade talking points. We don't listen to each other. Uh, so this is very ineffective, and uh, it is, we used to talk to the Russians at the height of the Cold War, the Soviets. Uh, we don't talk to the Chinese, but we're, we're risking a war with them that could destroy our country as well as theirs. Right, and so let, let me follow that up, uh, Lyle. What should the, okay, so we have seen us saying what they think that we should do, escalate the, the training so that we actually do crossfade, whatever. What do you think the United States should do? What is in America's national interest that promotes our security and our economic prosperity into the future? What should we do? Mm. Yeah, well, I think we should um, we should put aside this kind of hubris and arrogance, and uh, you know, we should, uh, I believe, embrace the idea of a, of a multipolar world, and and that you know, uh, it, it's not polite. To say, but but that involves you know essentially a granting the fact that other great powers have have a prerogative in their kind of spheres of influence. That's kind of the reality, and most realists um, will agree on that point. And and for Taiwan, of course, that means that Taiwan uh, is going to have to make some compromises. That's just uh, you know, and if you I think an objective reading of history and geography and the balance of power yields that uh, Taiwan has to be. Um, a part of a compromise, you know, hope, I believe that if we, um, you know, held by our agreements, that is the one China policy and also the 1982 communique, where we were generally reducing our involvement 
um, that Taipei and Beijing would quickly come to an amicable uh, agreement, actually, that would serve both sides. You know, China's not looking to invade the island and control, uh, have, have total control, right? Uh, one, one country, two systems um, is, is still uh, uh, Beijing's approach. So I actually think this would be settled peacefully. And then, you know, as far as our position in the Pacific, this, you know, just because we uh, want Taiwan to compromise, it does not mean that we are yielding the Pacific to China, not, not in the least. We have uh, real actual treaty allies, uh, namely the Philippines and, um, and Japan, both of these uh, giant island archipelagos are eminently defensible and we can take a defensive defense approach um you know meaning they're in the lead but we back them up in case they get invaded by china which is a, a kind of ridiculous possibility but i suppose you know you, you know we, we should maintain um, these alliances but we can take a much more relaxed approach uh put a lot of resources toward other national priorities and not worry about this so much you know china is not about to invade japan or something like that um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a more relaxed approach where we kind of live and let live with China, uh, and, um, you know, work on tough problems together, like, uh, you know, climate change and global development, things like that. And Mr. Ambassador, let me, let me, uh, end on this, uh, this question here that Lau brought up about our alliances in the area. This, this CNES stuff is talking about national decision-making stuff for the United States. To what extent do our regional allies in the Indo-Pacific, whether that's uh, uh, Australia, uh, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, uh, to what extent are they good or bad with the United States moving into this area where nuclear confrontation seems to be on the rise? Do they agree with that or does it trouble them? No, they have always looked to the United States to manage this issue in a way that did not produce a war. Um, many of them are very disturbed by the drift of U.S. policy toward emphasizing purely military rather than diplomatic means of, of addressing the danger of war. Uh, not a single one of them has made an official commitment to aid us in the event of a war with China over Taiwan. Uh, some, like Japan, which has a very serious uh, uh, strategic interest in the status of Taiwan, might join us. They might be forced into it because we could not defend Taiwan without using bases in Japan. Japan has not said it would let us do that. Uh, but if it, if it, if if we did, as Lyle indicated with Sasebo, um, Kadena, the air base in Okinawa, Sasebo, the submarine base, and other facilities in Japan would very likely be struck uh, by the Chinese, and that could bring the Japanese into the war. Uh, we also have the Russian wild card. Uh, we have pushed Russia and China into an entente. As Lyle indicated, Ch China has been very restrained in its approach to the Ukraine war. Would Russia be equally restrained in the event of a war that could destroy the America, uh, the Americans as a rival power by, de by, by devastating our fleet and our air force? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we have the potential to set off something that is much wider and much more consequential if the various scenarios that have been run, military war games that have been run, worked out the way some of them predict, uh, we would end a war with China in a very, very weakened state. What would that do to, in terms of Russian approaches to us or those of Iran or those of other designated enemies of the United States? Would North Korea refrain from going south? Again, we don't know. This is not to be examined in a purely regional context, and it cannot be necessarily restricted. If, it, if we have a war, that war cannot necessarily be limited uh, to the regional context. The you know, and I keep going back to, to what Lyle had said earlier about the sustainment capacity. Uh, you know, the United States has no... Possibly, we couldn't sustain one major war uh, against any adversary, much less more. And, and it's troubling to me, to, to say the least, when we, we showed a couple of days ago a clip from uh, David Petraeus, former CIA director, 
who said, I, he do not count him in one of those that said we could not handle something in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, and in uh, the European continent simultaneously. I, he says, there's no problem. But that is so divorced from reality. That's what troubles me about the prospect of us stumbling into something like what we're discussing here today. But it is a bad approach it, to take. It, it, it is. And, uh, and uh, listen, we, it, this is a, a, not a, a happy topic here. So, but uh, really, really appreciate you guys bringing in extraordinary amounts of expertise into this so that we do know what the realities are. And hopefully some of this information here will at least sober up some of these people who think that we can go and do some of these actions with no consequence can see that in a bad situation, it could be catastrophic, if not fatal for our country. So thank you both for coming on today. Thank you. Thanks. And we appreciate you guys coming on as well. Uh, and uh, you know, folks, listen, these, these are tough conversations, but you need to know the truth. And, and we need to get this out there so people understand what's at stake and that it's not necessary, that there are alternatives. There are ways that we can manage this to maintain stability, freedom of, of, of navigation, uh, you know, economic prosperity and, and national security. All these things are possible with just taking an appetite suppressant. We'll see how that works out, but you can count on us to keep bringing it for you. Thank you very much. We'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.